If you do this in earnestness and sincerity, it may possibly repair the mischief which your avarice has occasioned. King Midas bowed low, and when he lifted his head, the lustrous stranger had vanished. You will easily believe that Midas lost no time in snatching up a great earthen pitcher. But alas me, it was no longer earthen after he touched it. And hastening to the riverside, as he scampered along and forced his way through the shrubbery, it was positively marvelous to see how the foliage turned yellow behind him, as if the autumn had been there and nowhere else. On reaching the river's brink, he plunged headlong in, without waiting so much as to pull off his shoes. Poof! 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 snorted King Midas, as his head emerged out of the water. Well, this is really a refreshing bath, and I think it must have quite washed away the golden touch. And now for filling my pitcher. As he dipped the pitcher into the water, it gladdened his very heart to see it change from gold into the same good, honest earthen vessel which it had been before he touched it. He was conscious also of a change within himself. A cold, hard, and heavy weight seemed to have gone out of his bosom. No doubt his heart had been gradually losing its human substance and transmuting itself into insensible metal, but had now softened back again into flesh. Perceiving a violet that grew on the bank of the river, Midas touched it with his finger and was overjoyed to find that the delicate flower retained its purple hue instead of undergoing a yellow blight. The curse of the golden touch had, therefore, really been removed from him. King Midas hastened back to the palace, and I suppose the servants knew not what to make of it when they saw their royal master so carefully bringing home an earthen pitcher of water, which was to undo all the mischief that his folly had wrought, was more precious to Midas than an ocean of molten gold could have been. The first thing he did, as you need hardly be told, was to sprinkle it by handfuls over the golden figure of little Marigold. No sooner did it fall on her than you would have laughed to see how the rosy color came back to the dear child's cheek, and how she began to sneeze and sputter, and how astonished she was to find herself dripping wet and her father still throwing more water over her. Pray do not, dear father, cried she. See how you have wet my nice frock? which I put on only this morning. For Marigold did not know that she had been a little golden statue, nor could she remember anything that had happened since the moment when she ran with outstretched arms to comfort poor King Midas. Her father did not think it necessary to tell his beloved child how very foolish he had been, but contented himself with showing how much wiser he had now grown. For this purpose, he led little Marigold into the garden, where he sprinkled all the remainder of the water over the rose bushes, and with such good effect that above five thousand roses recovered their beautiful bloom. There were two circumstances, however, which as long as he lived used to put King Midas in mind of the golden touch. One was the sands of the river sparkled like gold, the other that little Marigold's hair had now a golden tinge, which he had never observed in it before she had been transmuted by the effect of his kiss. This change of hue was really an improvement, and made Marigold's hair richer than in her babyhood. When King Midas had grown quite an old man, and used to trot Marigold's children on his knee, he was fond of telling them this marvelous story, pretty much as I have now told it to you. And then would he stroke their glossy ringlets and tell them that their hair, likewise, had a rich shade of gold, which they had inherited from their mother. And to tell you the truth, my precious little folks, quoth King Midas, diligently trotting the children all the while, ever since that morning I have hated the very sight of all other gold save this. All right, so that is the end. So you are making sure you are doing your questions. Remember, this is our essential question. How do our possessions, or what do our possessions reveal about ourselves? 